We come now to our time of exhortation before we confess sin. And uh, this morning, our exhortation is, is geared towards our graduates. So um, we're not done with you yet, young men and women. So um, this is for you. Of course, it's, it applies to all of us. And our exhortation is coming from the Proverbs. We're going to jump around to a couple different passages, but we're looking at the sin of sloth or laziness. So TRC graduates, I'd especially like you to hear this exhortation. We're living in a time of unprecedented wealth and leisure. In your pockets, you have access to more information, tools, and resources um, than, than it, well, it, it would cost a fortune, uh, even just decades ago, to acquire what you have in your pocket um, that you probably didn't even pay for. At the same time, uh, the expectations of this society have, uh, for you, is probably lower uh, than any, any other time in American history. It seems like today the only thing that you really need to do to be viewed by uh, this society uh, as a good man or woman is really just to basically not commit any major heinous crimes. That's about, that's about the bar uh, that our culture has for you to meet. Um, so you can literally smoke weed all day, play video games, uh, collect unemployment benefits, father children outside of wedlock, um, and this society will, will affirm your choices uh, and, and call those valid. Um, and so today, you know, really the only meaningful form of self-expression um, is, um, is really the stuff you buy and the entertainment that you, the ways that you choose to entertain yourself. So that's kind of how you, in this day and age, sort of prove who you are and what you're about. So there's been this, this, this concerted effort to decouple um, your uh, identity and your reputation from the things that you have produced or the things that you have accomplished through hard work. And so with standards, with this kind of situation, with these kinds of standards and expectations that are so low, where's the motivation to be productive? Uh, who really cares? Well, God does. He designed the world uh, to reward diligence and um, over laziness. God is diligent. He made the entire universe from nothing. Then he made man in his image uh, to finish filling and taking dominion of this planet. Before the fall, before sin, God had work for man to do. And the work-life balance that God put in place was not this 50-50 kind of way that we think about it today, um, but it was actually six days of work and one day of rest. And so as you set out on this next phase of your life, one of the biggest hazards you will need to, um, you'll need to avoid in this day and age is laziness. Without your parents hovering over your shoulder to, or keeping tabs on you, there's going to be a greater opportunity to waste time on worthless entertainment and to do the bare minimum at, at your school or at your job or whatever it is you're going to do next. And laziness is a deadly trap that can ensnare you and leave you with a shriveled and disfigured soul. It's a big deal. Uh, the church has, has regarded laziness as one of the seven deadly sins for millennia. The good news, however, is that in a world filled with such low standards and so much laziness, you, TRC graduates, will have an unprecedented opportunity to lead and to capture territory for God's kingdom. And so with that goal in mind, I'd like to turn to the Proverbs, starting with Proverbs chapter 12, verse 24, which says, The hand of the diligent will rule, while the slothful will be put to forced labor. Our Lord Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father, ruling. Jesus didn't get into his position through nepotism. Jesus wasn't a uh, spoiled son. He earned his position at the right hand of God through a lifetime of faithful obedience to his Father and service to others, even death on a cross. We, who are called to imitate Christ, must also be diligent to do the good works that which God prepared in advance for us to do. The Proverbs also say that you see a man skillful in his work, he will stand before kings. So it, this, this further explains the idea of um, the hand of the diligent will, will rule. When you're diligent uh, in your work, you will become skillful in your work. And when you're skillful, 
kings start to take notice and to seek your help and counsel. Think about Joseph, right? He, he started in a, in a pit in the ground uh, after his, his brothers abandoned him and ended up uh, running Potiphar's entire household. And then he ends up in a prison, and uh, from that prison, he, he rises to uh, basically rule the entire Egyptian empire and save the world from famine. So the hand of the diligent will rule. Um, this means that it's God's design. This is God's good design for rulers and leaders. Before men become rulers of others, they must first demonstrate that they can rule themselves. All righteous government depends upon faithful self-government. However, the slothful, Proverbs 12, 24 says, will be put to forced labor. If you cannot rule yourself, then you will be ruled by someone else. And it probably won't be fun. You don't have to look hard on social media uh, these days to find people who talk about how much they hate their jobs. You can, you can take it to the bank that these people who hate their jobs are lazy. They hate their job likely for two reasons. One, because it's work and they're lazy. <laughs> they don't like work. And two, um, because it's forced labor. They're not doing what they had dreamed of doing someday. Because they're slothful, they were forced into taking a job uh, the job that they have, and not the job perhaps that they wanted. They had no options because they have no value in the marketplace because they have been lazy. So we want you, TRC graduates, to become rulers in the various domains that the Lord places you in. And so you need to be diligent. The second proverb we'll look at is Proverbs 13, verse 4. The soul of the sluggard craves and gets nothing, while the soul of the diligent is richly supplied. Sin, like grapes, grows in bunches. The slothful man is not only lazy, but he's also usually discontent and full of envy. It says the sluggard craves and gets nothing. So he fantasizes about the new car or the good job or a wife, uh, but he gets nothing. And so he's discontent. And frequently that discontent leads to malice towards those who have the things that he wishes he had. It's interesting how Solomon contrasts this slothful man and this sluggard kind of situation with a diligent man's soul. The soul of the diligent is richly supplied. It doesn't say the pantry of the diligent is richly supplied. It doesn't say the bank account of the diligent is richly supplied. Um, It says the soul of the diligent man is richly supplied. Of course, those things are probably also true, um, but diligence leads to contentment. There's a kind of rest that can only be enjoyed by after a hard work, uh, after a hard week of work. A deep rest of a soul that is that is truly satisfied, not because you necessarily have all the wealth you could ever want, but because it's satisfying to end a work week knowing that you have delivered real value to your partners and your teammates. Meaningful work scratches an itch in your soul that leaves you feeling better off than when you started. It turns out that the process of delivering value to others, uh, that that in that process of delivering value to others, you yourself gain value and your soul is enriched. And so if you want to have a fat soul, content in all circumstances, then be diligent. Finally, we'll look at uh, Proverbs uh, chapter 26, verse 16. The sluggard is wiser in his own eyes than seven men who can answer sensibly. The sluggard is convinced that he's the smart one. Everyone else is dumb. He has it all figured out. All those industrious people are tools working for the man. He tells himself that he knows how to work smart and not hard. He's sure that the productive families he sees at church are putting on a show. They're the Pharisees and busybodies. They're all fake. He's being real. There may be seven sensible men who tell him that what he's doing is stupid, but he's convinced that he's wiser than all of them. Laziness, again, leads to self-deception. What starts as laziness quickly becomes delusion and self-deception because rather than admit he's lazy, the slothful man comes up with elaborate ways to explain why his situation is special and it's not his fault. And so he becomes wise in his own eyes and bitter toward the cruel world and jealous 
of those who he believes uh, have the wealth that he deserves or the success that he deserves. He ended up in his way, in this way, because he was lazy. So TRC graduates, I'd like to tell you, like to warn you that a snare has been set for you. It will be all too easy for you to be lazy and to appear like you're getting along just fine in this day and age. It's not hard to feign diligence and convince everyone around you that you're not lazy, in large part because our work is so, tends to be so separate from our family and from our church and from uh, the other parts of our lives. But God knows, and he will not be mocked. Christ will cleanse and forgive our laziness if we repent and turn to him, but the consequences that Scripture warns us of uh, with respect to laziness are baked into the fabric of creation, and you will not escape those consequences. So, look at the ant, you sluggard. Young men, read the Proverbs over and over and over until they come out of your pores like sweat when you're working diligently. They are written for you, those Proverbs. Young ladies, if you want a role model for diligence, look to the Proverbs 31 woman. Aspire to have her competence and diligence and be so productive that as Proverbs 31 concludes, her works praise her in the gates. Our expectation for the next generation of, of uh, this next generation of Trinity Reformed Church are high. We have high expectations for you. To whom much is given, much is required. We desire to see Huntsville become a garden city set on a hill, a sanctuary city for God's people out of which flow the rivers of living water to heal the nations of the world. Accomplishing this vision will require a lot of work. Businesses need to be started. Churches need to be planted. Unbelievers converted. And many children raised up and educated in the faith. Our plan for this, and God's plan, is you our godly sons and daughters. It's your turn to step up and make your mark on the, in the kingdom. So set your hand to the plow and join us in this glorious work.